Okay, hello. Well, this is Stephen Rowe, uh, Assistant Professor at uh, Johns Hopkins. And although normally I would be speaking to you about some topic in pet imaging, today uh, I'm going to be in the CT world uh, discussing uh, a new 3D visualization technique called cinematic rendering. Just a short, quick disclosure here. Uh, at first, I'd like to touch on some general principles of cinematic rendering. This is a new 3D visualization method. We primarily use it in our practice for volumetric CT data, although you can use it for MRI. And it allows for the production of photorealistic or lifelike rendering with enhanced surface detail and realistic shadowing effects. What's the difference between cinematic rendering and volume rendering? Well, both uh, cinematic rendering and volume rendering make use of thin slice reconstructed isotropic voxels. And with those thin slices, you take those reconstructions and you create a volume with both methods. And then you assign each voxel within that volume a color and a translucency based on its density and its component tissues. However, whereas volume rendering uses ray casting, where the pixel that you see is uh, just a sum total of a, a single uh, ray of light that's been shined through all of the, the component voxels that make up that pixel, cinematic rendering uses a much more complex lighting model that takes into account a number of things like uh, refraction of light, interaction of light with uh, objects that are outside of the voxel that they're directly passing through and as a result you get a much more uh, a much richer look to the image a much more photorealistic look to the image and you create realistic shadowing effects that add to the depth of the image and uh, this just uh, uh, reiterates that so again a global lighting model realistic shadowing uh, and uh, and high high levels of surface detail and with that, I'd like to basically just spend the rest of the time showing you a lot of examples of cinematic rendering in action. I'm going to start with musculoskeletal applications, show you a few neuro examples, and then wrap up with some examples from uh, cardiovascular imaging. Here's, a, here's an arm, uh, and as you can see with cinematic rendering, uh, you can show a variety of different tissues uh, depending on how you've uh, windowed and uh, where, where you've set your window width and levels uh, with the, the cinematic uh, uh, rendering process. So you can show soft tissue, muscle, you even show skin very well. Uh, Contrast enhanced vessels show up really well. And then bone shows up particularly well, very high contrast material. You can really see it well with cinematic rendering and see very, very small detail in the bone. Here's some additional examples uh, from, the same, uh, from the same patient. Again, uh, contrast enhanced vasculature shows really well, in particular the, the image on the uh, rightmost panel where you've dropped out the bone and have just the, the vessels. You can see very subtle vascular injury in, in musculoskeletal trauma cases with this technique. It is really important to look at your cinematic rendered volume from a number of different angles. Because of the realistic shadowing effects that you get with cinematic rendering, it's easy to obscure potential uh, important phys uh, pathology. So you don't want to treat these as static images that you can look at from just one direction. You really have to move the volume around, look from a number of different directions, adjust your window width and level settings uh, to make sure that you have an obscured important pathology. Maybe getting a little ahead of ourselves, but one of the things that we ponder is whether the enhanced surface detail and the better soft tissue delineation that you can get with cinematic rendering may replace MRI in certain contexts. I think you could imagine this in the emergency room setting. Uh, you can really see things like uh, tendons and other soft tissues very well with cinematic rendering. So you may not always need MRI in those contexts to be able to uh, safely rule out an injury to a patient. Here's an example of a uh, pretty gnarly uh, Schatzker type six fracture of the tibial plateau. Uh, volume rendering certainly shows that this is an extensively comminuted fracture and shows that there are a number of fracture fragments involved. But with those, those shadows that create a sense of where each object within the volume is relative to other objects, uh, you get a much better sense of this fracture in the cinematic rendered image. Here's an example of a soft tissue injury. Uh, we practice in Baltimore. There's lots of soft tissue injuries in Baltimore, in particular penetrating traumas such as stab wounds and gunshot wounds. Here's an example of a patient that was stabbed in the thigh. 
Uh, well, the MIP image on the far left shows a subtle vascular injury that's also recapitulated on the volume rendered image. With the cinematic rendered images, you really get nice soft tissue detail. So you can actually show the soft tissue laceration through the muscle and you don't lose anything in terms of being able to still see that uh, very small vascular injury uh, that's uh, present in the, uh, in the rightmost panels here. This is an example of a hip fracture dislocation. I think the most impressive part of this for me is the uh, shown by the red arrow in the middle panel. Uh, you can really get a sense for the portion of the femoral head that's been left within the acetabulum here uh, and the relationship of that, that fracture fragment with the acetabulum and with, uh, with the other bony structures of the, the hip. Uh, here's a femoral neck fracture, uh, maybe a little subtle on the 2D, certainly shows up well in the volume rendered, but again, uh, photorealism with, uh, with the cinematic rendered images. Uh, and not, a, not an acute injury here, a, a hip dysplasia. Uh, the uh, 2D images certainly show that this is a dysplastic uh, right femoral head, that the acetabulum is also dysplastic, but the manner in which those structures really fit together, uh, much better shown with the, the depth that you get with the cinematic rendered image. Uh, this is a patient doesn't look like much in the, the top couple of panels. Uh, looks like a fairly small soft tissue injury. However, this was a bullet wound. Uh, and as you can see, you had a very comminuted uh, ballistic fracture of the proximal humerus. What's I think most striking here is that even though we have a bunch of metal artifact from bullet fragments in the wound, uh, we can still very nicely see all of the fracture fragments. Uh, we do see a little bit of that artifact, uh, but it doesn't prevent us from creating uh, nice cinematic rendered images that appropriately show the pathology. Uh, here's an elbow dislocation. One of the questions that the clinicians are going to have is the uh, is whether the vascularity has remained intact. Here I think you can see very nicely that the, the vessels are, are nicely opacified. Uh, they're well shown by cinematic rendering. Nothing here to indicate a vascular injury. Uh, this is a superficial uh, stab wound uh, in this case. Uh, no, no harm to the deeper structures, bones intact, vessels are intact, uh, but you can see actually the defect in the biceps muscle and you can even see the packing material that the uh, ER has placed within the, within the defect. This is a patient that had a fall on an outstretched hand. Uh, again, distal radius fracture. Uh, again, all the fracture fragments very nicely shown by cinematic rendering. And of course, the overlying soft tissues can also be shown if those are of interest. Don't see these too often, but a frank ankle dislocation. Uh, you're certainly going to be worried about vascular injury, which again can nicely be shown by cinematic rendering. Uh, but also as the orthopedic surgeons go to have to put this back together, you can imagine they would uh, appreciate the photorealism and the uh, high detail of uh, where the bones are relative to each other that's shown by the cinematic renders. This is an interesting case. This is a patient with dermatomyositis with extensive soft tissue calcifications. Uh, as you can see, she has uh, soft tissue calcifications really uh, extending throughout, <clears throat> throughout the muscles of the upper arm and the forearm. This has been a longstanding process. Uh, this is uh, certainly shown nicely, in particular by the MIP images that really bring out all the calcifications in the soft tissues. Uh, but when you go to the cinematic rendered images, the, the relative positions of the calcifications in comparison to, say, vascular or nervous structures, uh, and even the texture of the calcifications and how dense they are is, is shown with uh, higher definition than, than you can achieve with, uh, with volume rendering. I'd like to show you a few neuro applications. Uh, here's a patient with a mandibular fracture. Uh, certainly no one's going to miss this on the volume rendered images, but uh, again, for uh, level of detail, the cinematic renders uh, really, really do show this fracture nicely. A patient with multiple facial fractures, including mandibular fractures. Uh, again, uh, volume rendering shows those, but, uh, but you get the added photorealism of cinematic rendering. Uh, it may be able to get a little bit better sense for how the fracture fragments fit together. This is a sad case of a patient with polyostatic fibrous dysplasia. Unfortunately, very, uh, a very deforming process uh, and was actually losing vision in her right eye. I think what the cinematic renders really get you here is just how profound the deformity of the right orbit is. And with the, sh the realistic shadowing effects, you really see how shadowed out the, the deep part of the orbit is. And you can imagine the, the effects that are happening on the optic nerve here and why the patient was losing vision.
Uh, this is a patient that took a gunshot wound to the face. Uh, maybe not a lot to do in the acute setting here from a surgical perspective besides just stabilize the patient. But you can imagine uh, it, when it is time to try to put uh, put some of the facial bones back together, uh, seeing all of these individual fracture fragments and seeing their relative positions uh, in such high uh, detail uh, would certainly be an advantage for cinematic rendering. And this is a patient that had a large squamous cell carcinoma that had eroded through the uh, nasal cavity and into the sinuses and unfortunately had had really deformed a lot of the face uh, with cinematic rendering you're able to show the soft tissues and, and get a sense for where the soft tissues are at but then as you sort of gradually peel back those soft tissues you can actually show uh, all the effects on the bony structures and here you can see that many of them are significantly eroded and this is a, another uh, impressive squamous cell carcinoma uh, cinematic rendering i think gets you a couple of things here in the uh, panels that are uh, second from the right, uh, you can see all the neovascularity of this large tumor, uh, and that can be helpful for surgical planning. What I think you also get is that if you compare the uh, a couple of the bottom panels, the one second from the left and the one all the way on the right. With volume rendering, uh, because you don't really have shadowing and volume rendering, it's hard to appreciate that there's a large uh, through and through defect in the skull because the inner table on the opposite side of the skull uh, essentially shows through and, and almost covers up the defect. But with the realistic shadowing effects in the cinematic rendering, no question at all, you nicely see that, uh, that there's a, a through and through defect in the, the frontal part of the skull here. And this is an example of a calvarial osteoma. Uh, one might think this could be a heavy calcified meningioma, but I think what cinematic rendering shows you here is that this is growing off of a thin stalk and then branching out and becoming larger uh, away from its origin along the inner table of the skull. That would be atypical for a meningioma. And in this case, I think the cinematic rendering actually helps you make the correct diagnosis. All right, and then I want to wrap up with some chest and cardiovascular uh, imaging uh, applications and uh, show you some examples of uh, how cinematic rendering might be helpful in this context. Uh, here is a coronary artery to pulmonary artery fistula. These are apparently fairly commonly seen by our cardiology colleagues at cather uh, catheterization, uh, but we don't see them too often on imaging. Nonetheless, with cinematic rendering, you can see this fine mesh of vessels that kind of wraps around the main pulmonary artery trunk. This is a patient that came in after a car accident, uh, had hemomediastinum, and the concern was, uh, does the patient also have an acute uh, traumatic aortic injury? Uh, the differential here would be a potential ductus diverticulum. I think this is a difficult call to make really on, on any modality and with any uh, visualization method, but you do get a good sense on the cinematic renders that there, while there's an acute angle with the underside of the aortic arch, there's an obtuse angle with the descending aorta. And this really does seem to be more characteristic of a ductus diverticulum. This patient was uh, monitored for a couple of days in the hospital. Uh, nothing changed about, uh, about the aorta, and the patient was eventually discharged home after no invasive procedures. Uh, here's another example of a ductus diverticulum. Maybe a little bit easier call to make because of the small amount of calcification at the, at the tip of the, of the diverticulum. And then yet another example of a ductus diverticulum. Uh, this one maybe is, it would be the easiest call in the sense that uh, uh, the morphology is most suggestive of a ductus and, and not an acute aortic injury. Uh, and that's well shown on the cinematic rendered image. Uh, but here is an acute aortic injury. And particularly on the cinematic rendered images, you really get a sense for how there's uh, two acute angles that this injury makes with the descending aorta. Uh, and you have this almost button-like appearance of, of uh, the, uh, uh, the aorta kind of coming out where the, where the injury occurred. And so this, this, was, uh, this was an emergency in this particular case, and this patient did go to endovascular repair. Uh, this is just an example of normal anatomy. This is the left atrial appendage. And just wanted to show really how remarkable the level of detail you can achieve with good presets, good window width and level uh, with cinematic rendering. <coughs> uh, this is an example of a stenosis in the left anterior descending uh, uh, coronary artery. And what I really wanted to show here was that if you have improperly chosen uh, how you're how you're windowing this this image, um, 
and you don't have the right presets, you can actually wind up with the main pulmonary artery obscuring uh, your pathology here. So that's shown in the bottom right panel. So you really do have to interact with these data sets and you really have to uh, make sure that you get a lot of different views and a lot of different images in order to not miss pathology. This is a patient that had an intracardiac spindle cell tumor, and I think you get a nice sense for how the tumor interrupts the contrast column within the, within the chambers of the heart uh, and a bit of the texture of the tumor on the cinematic rendered images. Uh, this is a patient with a large and complex abdominal aortic aneurysm. Uh, and when you look at the uh, cinematic rendered images, you really get a nice sense for how the mesenteric vascul vasculature arises off of this uh, aneurysm. Uh, here's a patient with Louise Dietz syndrome. This is something that uh, probably isn't seen a lot outside of, of our practice here at Hopkins, but uh, uh, it has some similarities to Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and some of the other vasculopathies. Uh, these patients uh, often present with uh, uh, numerous aneurysms, dissections, uh, often needing extensive repairs. And you can see here uh, how nicely shown all the, the uh, graphs and uh, the patient's underlying uh, vasculopathic findings are shown. Uh, here's an example of uh, renal artery fibromuscular dysplasia. Uh, you know, again, nice, nicely shown certainly on the volume rendering, but you get a little bit of an advantage with the, the, the photorealism of the, the cinematic renders. And here's a patient with distal aortic occlusion with collateral vessel formation. Uh, you get a nice sense for where the aorta cuts off on the cinematic rendered images, and you really nicely see uh, all of the collateral vessels. Uh, here are a few more of those collateral vessels, in this case, in the anterior abdominal wall. And you can fade in and fade out however much of the soft tissue you want to see uh, in addition to the, to the vessels. So... You know, what, uh, what cinematic rendering is really lacking at this point are nice prospective studies to assess the clinical utility. I think we will get there. Uh, I think those are starting to, to really uh, uh, get going at, at our center and others. Uh, I think we also need phantom studies just to assure ourselves that the manner of visualization with cinematic rendering uh, doesn't cause uh, artifacts that, that might overestimate or underestimate the degree of pathology. I think one thing that we'll see is that there'll be less 3D printing uh, with the with the availability of cinematic rendering. Uh, if 3D printing is being done to get a better sense for pathology, a lot of that can be done actually uh, without having to do expensive 3D printing with uh, with cinematic rendering. And I think this is going to be invaluable for the education of trainees, uh, for patient engagement, uh, and for things along those lines where we need to uh, impart a lot of information with uh, with photorealistic images. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge a few folks that I work with, and thank you for your attention.